Gentlemen, welcome to tonight's program. I'm Neve King. I'm the Vice President for Programs and Strategic Content here at the Chicago Council. And we're thrilled to welcome you to our panel tonight to talk about monetary policy, a very timely topic indeed as leadership at the Fed transitions from Janet Yellen to Jerome Powell. Our program this evening is part of a full day of events celebrating the career of our Vice Chair and Distinguished Fellow in the Global Economy, um, Michael Mosco. As many of you know, Michael was the President of the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago for more than a decade, from 1994 to 2007. And what better way to celebrate his contributions to the field than with this discussion tonight? Thank you to the Federal Reserve Board of Chicago, to Jeff Ronan, David Nelms, and Anne Primajori for their support in planning today's events. We'd also like to thank the Consul General of Japan for some of our program we've been doing uh, with the Japanese Consulate on Economic Issues. Tomorrow we'll be hosting a symposium with the Japanese on the Asia-Pacific Economic Integration. If you'd like to join us in person, let us know tonight, otherwise you can join us online tomorrow. And now back to tonight, we're on the record, we're live streaming. Please make sure you silence your phones, otherwise it'll interrupt the program. And if you'd like to take uh, questions through your phone, you can. There's instructions over there, chi.cnf.io, otherwise you can raise your arm later and we'll take them that way. And as many of you know, for nearly a century, the Council has provided an independent, nonpartisan platform for a variety of different perspectives to promote deeper global understanding. And the views expressed by individuals on this platform are their own and do not represent institutional positions or views of the Council. I'll be back up for Q&A, but first we have a special guest here to say a few words about Michael Mosco as well as introducing our panel. So please join me in welcoming to the stage a Chicago Council Board Director and also President of the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago, Charlie Evans. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Neve. Uh, welcome. Someone once told me that back in the 1980s, when you walked by the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago, there was an air of mystery about the place. People wondered when, what went on behind the imposing pillars, and very few people really knew. In 1994, when Michael Mosco became the eighth president and chief executive officer, he resolved that the Chicago Fed would become a much more open and transparent institution, clearly focused on serving the public interest. Within his first two weeks on the job, Michael held a press conference at the Fed. This would have been an unnerving undertaking for most, but not for Michael. John Barry, the Washington Post, then the dean of Fed watching journalists back then, lauded his performance. That certainly was high praise. Calling on his government and corporate business experience, Michael addressed the challenges of his new role by spending the time and making the effort, working harder than most and quickly establishing himself as an influential voice inside the Fed. When it came to monetary policy issues and debates, Michael was methodical. He studied all of the angles, assessed the situation carefully, worked to understand the best approaches, and then, with a clear understanding, contributed to the policy debate. Michael extended his vision of a more open Fed beyond the confines of Chicago and the 7th Federal Reserve District here in Chicago. He contributed to improving the transparency of the Federal Reserve System through his work on the Federal Open Market Committee, communications committees with Don Cohn, Roger Ferguson, Ben Bernanke, and others. These efforts were transformative. They helped foster the evolution of the now essential FOMC statements from 1994 onward. They transformed the sleepy, semi-annual Humphrey Hawkins economic submissions into the current, exciting, breathtaking, <laughs> quarterly, summary of economic projections, and eventually led, after his departure, to the FOMC's formalization of a long-run strategy for monetary policy that quantified our price stability goal as a symmetric 2% inflation target, and that was an important milestone. Within the Chicago Fed, Michael opened up the internal workings of the bank by creating a flatter organization and a corporate culture with more open communication and better collaboration across departments. Small informal touches helped, as he insisted on being identified as Michael rather than Dr. Mosco, and job titles were left at the door. Big changes, especially cultural ones, take time and plenty of effort. Michael firmly believed in keeping senior leaders accountable for everything they did. That's the mark of top organizations. His strong and persistent efforts established a corporate culture at the bank that bears his signature to this day. As his successor, I found that maintaining the best corporate culture possible is a continuing challenge, but Michael instilled in me the value of meeting this challenge, and so it's important that I strive to do uh, that as Chicago Fed president. Let me close with one last thought. During Michael's 13-year tenure on the FOMC, 
The economy grew a robust 3.2% a year, and the unemployment rate averaged 5%. There was one brief recession lasting just eight months, so pretty darn good. Federal funds rate went up, it went down, and it remained unchanged for substantial periods of time, and that's a good outcome if you're not at the zero lower bound. Inflation continued its long, steady decline. Indeed, the committee reached a landmark in the spring of 2003 when the FOMC statement first acknowledged that it was possible that inflation could become uncomfortably low. This was an eye-opening development for all of us who lived through the battle against high inflation in the 1970s and 1980s. I succeeded Michael in September of 2007. Almost overnight, the economy experienced a financial crisis <laughs> and slid into the deepest recession since the Great Depression. During my tenure as president of the Chicago Fed, economic growth has been just 1.4% a year, and the unemployment rate has averaged 7%. You know, just, gee, this reminds me of the time I went depressingly to visit the Jimmy Carter Presidential Museum that reminded me of how bad 1977 and 1980 were. The federal funds rate went down. It remained unchanged for an extraordinarily long length of time, and only recently has it risen. Inflation has averaged under 1.5%. And thanks to the openness that Michael championed, we have a way to measure by just how much this means uh, that we've missed our inflation goal. So as you can see, Michael's timing was impeccable. And this too taught me an important lesson, the art of timely exit. That is, let's get on with uh, tonight's sessions. Let me now turn to introducing the expert panel we have joining Michael here tonight. They will take a look at how monetary policy has changed in the years since the financial crisis and where we go from here. Their more comprehensive biographies are on the screen in front of you, but very briefly, I thought maybe they'd come in at this point. Um, <laughs> Donald Cohn is the Robert V. Rusa Chair in International Economics and a Senior Fellow in Economic Studies at the Brookings Institution. He's a 40-year veteran of the Federal Reserve System and served as Vice Chair of the Board of Governors from 2002 to 2010. There is not a single meeting discussing financial crises during his tenure at the Federal Reserve that he was not in the room at the moment, and that goes back to the 1970s Chrysler bailout. Randall Krosner is the Norman R. Bobbins Professor of Economics at the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. He previously served as a governor of the Federal Reserve System from 2006 to 2009. And our moderator tonight, Bethany McLean, is an investigative journalist and a contributing editor at Vanity Fair. She's the author of All the Devils Are Here, The Hidden History of the Financial Crisis, among other books. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our panel. Thank you very much for the introductions, President Evans. It's the beginning of a new year, and we're about to see a change in leadership from Jim Yellen to Jerome Powell. Just as I was coming into this event, the news flashed across my screen that Powell was confirmed, not that that was um, unexpected. But this is the perfect time to discuss what may come next for monetary policy. But first, I wanted to start with a really basic question for each of you, and, and I'll start with you, Don. Why does monetary policy matter? It's a great question. Uh, <laughs> Before I answer, I want to say what an honor and a pleasure it is to be here with Michael Moscow to celebrate many years of service and, uh, and a notable birthday. I told a friend I was coming to Chicago to participate in a panel on monetary policy to celebrate someone's 80th birthday. And he said, that's how you celebrate an 80th birthday? <laughs> <laughs> I said, you don't know Michael. He's a, he's a policy wonk in eight different areas, and I guess uh, we covered those this afternoon. Maybe that's so, a good answer. <laughs> great, to, great to be here. So why does monetary policy matter? I think it matters because what the monetary policy makers do, what the FOMC does, has a lot to do with how many people are employed, the unemployment rate, the rate of growth of, of the economy, and the inflation rate. So Congress has given the Federal Reserve a dual mandate, maximum employment, stable prices. The Fed tries to hit that. Lots of things affect all that. But what happens in that FOMC room, guided by people, good, sensible people like Michael Moscow, has an awful lot to do with how close we come to it as a country. Michael, what would you add to that? 
So before I answer the question, <laughs> let me just thank Don Cohen for coming here today and Randy Krasner. We, I really appreciate uh, the fact that you're both here. And uh, thank everyone else who participated in uh, programs starting at lunchtime today. Um, so the answer to the question, I can't add much to what Don said, but I would just say Fed controls the money supply. And the money supply influences, primarily influences inflation. So as Don said, uh, the Fed is a dual mandate. I would say I'd reverse the order and say price stability and maximum employment. Um, and uh, th so the Fed has an immediate impact on both prices in the economy and employment in the economy. Very important topics to everyone in this room. <coughs> Randy, what would you add? And I'm also absolutely delighted to, to be here with, uh, with Michael, who has uh, always been incredibly kind and generous and was a great mentor to me when I uh, joined the Fed in, uh, in 2006. Uh, my experience is a little bit like uh, Charlie's in terms of timing. I was there from 2006 to 2009. As I always say, the easy years uh, during the financial crisis. So I, I, I've never looked at the statistics, the statistics for me, but my guess is we'd be competing uh, pretty well on that. <laughs> so uh, I'll take um, the point of view of, or mention the point of view of one of my colleagues, Gene Fama, who has a Nobel Prize in economics. And uh, you can actually see, a, uh, a, uh, I guess it would be the equivalent of a podcast, a, a video that we did where Gene's view is that the Fed doesn't have any influence. How could it be? It's just substituting one asset for another. And I go, Gene, you really think that like in the financial crisis, it didn't matter what the Fed did? He said, well, if it did have any effect, it's not the effects you thought. And so they're still, so you have people who are you know, extremely smart, extremely accomplished, and would say, you know, uh, Don and Michael are, are um, you know, just uh, all, uh, all wet. They, they, they don't really, they think that they have more, more control than they do over these things. And um, You're uh, in that category, too. Uh, no, <laughs> no, certainly, I, I, I'm, yeah, exactly. Uh, so I think, but what's interesting about that is that there are a lot of people who are very skeptical, especially post-crisis, about what central banks can and can't do. And, uh, and so I think it's, it's an important reminder, I mean, I think all of us here, think it is crucial and important. And for example, um, in addition to what, uh, uh, what Don and, uh, and Michael said, also uh, it's uh, something that can be very helpful in responding to, to a crisis. And there's a long history of, of that. The old lady of Threadneedle Street from 1694, the, the Bank of England uh, responded to, to crises. And there was a, a, a supposed effective rule book by this person named uh, Badgett from the 19th century who said that you can, uh, if in a crisis, um, a central bank lends and uh, uh, lends quickly, uh, at, actually at a penalty rate, that's how you uh, that's how you respond to a crisis. Actually, we had the same idea, half of the idea we accepted, which was lend broadly, but at a low rate, not at a uh, at a high rate. And so uh, these ideas of what central banks can and can't do and how they should respond are, it's not as settled as it uh, as it might seem. So I want to come back to this notion of skepticism about what central banks can and can't do. But let's start with the easy years first. Um, the 2008 financial crisis, almost a decade ago, and it marked the beginning, I think, of what people have started to refer to as unconventional monetary policy. You played a leading role in that, Randy. What does unconventional monetary policy mean? And so it gets back to what we were just talking about. So there's a shock that comes to the economy, and so you could do nothing which is what happened in the early 1930s. What's astonishing is if you go back to the minutes from the Fed uh, in the early 1930s, what you see is lots of discussions of inflation. Now, the price level is falling by 30% uh, over the uh, early 1930s. No discussion of deflation. The unemployment rate is 20%, very little discussion of that. GDP is falling by about a third. The discussion is about the potential for inflation when the economy comes back. And, uh, and so sometimes it's pretty easy to miss what you should be, should be doing. And I think in some sense we were all students of uh, Friedman and Schwartz who um, blamed the depression becoming the Great Depression and the Fed's inaction. And so I think uh, some of the, there were a lot of different aspects to unconventional policy. One was trying to use the balance sheet. So make sure that um, the, um, uh, the liquidity was, uh, was put back into the system. But something that was really unconventional about that is because the change in the way the financial system developed from the 1930s to today is that it's not just banks that are making loans, not just banks that are providing credit. 
Uh, and in fact, if you look at these rough measures of so-called shadow banking that uh, is not well defined, but let's say, use like a New York Fed definition of that, basically the, the traditional banking system is less than half of the entire system. So you can kind of think about it as there's usually sort of the bathtub and then there are pipes coming out of the bathtub that are going to all of the, uh, the different areas of the economy. In the old days, uh, what was putting the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the liquidity into the bathtub was the banking system with the, the Fed, uh, Fed behind it. What happened is all those pipes, pipes got clogged. So we had to try to think of ways to uh, get over that, get liquidity to the different, uh, to di the different parts of the economy because the pipes of the traditional financial system were clogged and also that the traditional financial system was uh, only a small part of what, uh, what it used to be. And so doing things like lending to institutions that are not commercial banks, that was something that can, is only done in uh, using the, uh, the unconventional, uh, the uh, uh, unconventional policies, the emergency uh, uh, powers that the, the Fed has given. Buying lots of assets, now on small, uh, small scale, that's something that is quite similar to what uh, central banks will do in, uh, in downturn or crisis periods, but buying long-term assets, getting the balance sheet to go from $800 billion to, uh, to $4.5 trillion, that was certainly unconventional. And also, all the lending that Badgett and others had talked about was always short-term, just overnight, because crises were seen as something that's very short, just an acute crisis that if you put enough liquidity in the system that would ease things, this clearly was not one of those, um, those issues. So a third thing that was done is to extend the length of the, the lending. So it went from overnight to a little bit longer to longer, longer, longer. And now you see like the ECB doing long-term refinancing operations that are in the order of three to four years. Uh, so I think those are the three, three things that I think of as unconventional. Don, how much does this change things going forward? Well, that's a... Um... I think it could change things because interest rates are very low. Um, if we get hit with a negative shock to the economy, something bad happens, could happen overseas, it could happen anywhere, then the Fed won't have, be able to lower interest rates the way it used to. So one way to think about, another way to think about what Randy was saying is unconventional monetary policy. We, we got to November, December 2008. Usually in a recession, the Fed lowers interest rates. They were already zero. Yeah. So what do you do then? Fortunately, we were led by Ben Bernanke. Ben Bernanke had, was a student of the Depression, so he very well recognized the problems that were uh, not addressed adequately then and the problems that Randy cited of clogged up pipes. And he'd also thought about Japan and the issues they were having and how to stimulate the economy when interest rates were already at zero. So he said, let's intervene a little bit further out the yield curve. Usually the Fed would lower, lower short-term rates, that would lower mortgage rates, car loan rates, that sort of thing, that would stimulate some spending, uh, would raise the stock market, that would make people feel better, it would lower the exchange rate, that would help imports. There we were stuck at zero. We said, well, instead of lowering interest rates, we can't write it there, we'll lower them out in the intermediate term range. And we can do that by buying assets. And we bought mortgage-backed securities, treasury securities, agency securities, longer-term securities to put downward pressure on those interest rates, and also through forward guidance about interest rates. So we said <coughs> interest rates are zero. And this is a serious problem that the economy is facing, and they're going to be zero for a considerable period of time. An extended period was the first phrase we used, and that guidance about future interest rates evolved over time. So we could lower intermediate and long-term rates, both by purchasing the securities and by talking about the fact that interest rates, short-term rates, are going to be low for a considerable period, and that helps stimulate the economy. It was disappointing for a while, and there were things working against the Fed, but ultimately, as we see today, with 4% unemployment and uh, inflation just a little below the 2% target, it, it worked, but it took, it took a while. So I think those tools, those unconventional monetary policy tools, will need to stay in the Fed's toolkit at least in reserve for some future situation in which interest rates are very, very low and the economy is still weak. 
Michael, what do you think about the use of these unconventional tools? Are they, have it, has it changed monetary policy forever, or we, will, will we look back at this period and say this was just a blip? So, of course, I was not in the Fed or at the FOMC at the time. But you were yeah. So I can be yeah. very objective. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> He's the market timer. Right. <laughs> so I would divide it into uh, uh, two categories. I see first, first, what unconventional steps did the Fed take during the crisis? And uh, all the uh, programs dealing with liquidity that Randy mentioned. And, and I would say, um, I would say almost everyone gives the Fed very high marks for what they did during the crisis. They did unclog the pipes, and the pipes were really clogged. Uh, and people were calling up and saying they couldn't get loans and so forth. So I think the Fed gets very high marks for that. Then, as, as Don said, they focused on this longer term question. They couldn't lower short term rates any for, anymore. They hit the zero bound. So they started to try to influence longer term rates by buying uh, securities, mortgage-backed securities, government agency securities, government bonds. And the effort was to lower long-term rates, to stimulate borrowing, um, and uh, also to encourage people to move into higher-risk assets as well during that period. So my sense is that that did have a positive impact. Uh, that's the good news. Uh, the other side of this is that they now have a balance sheet, as Randy said, with $4.5 trillion on it. Um, when I left the Fed, it was $800 billion. So that's a huge balance sheet, and they now have to unwind that. And they have said uh, publicly, I think very appropriately, um, started shouting it from the rooftops <laughs> how they're going to lower that balance sheet. We're going to do it gradually. We're going to do it at a, pro at a certain pace. They said what, how many, what, um, what, uh, how many securities they will not renew. Uh, coming due this month, and then there's a certain pattern for that. So it's an automatic pilot. And they're going to deal with short-term problems uh, with the Fed funds target and not this automatic pilot of lowering the long-term rates. However, we've never been here before. Yep. We don't, we're really in uncharted waters. So we have two types of tightening taking place. You have this automatic pilot of trying to redu of reducing the uh, balance sheet, on the one hand, uh, which if you affected long-term rates uh, when you were buying securities, presumably it's going to affect them in some way when you're selling securities. And then, of course, you have the, the short-term rate. Is, you're tightening the short-term rates. So this is a very delicate time for the Federal Reserve. Uh, they're confident that they can handle it. Uh, I, I hope they can. But as I say, we're, we don't really know because we've never been here before. Alan Greenspan, who served for 19 years as the Fed's chair before Bernanke and obviously before Yellen, said that we are going through a period with no precedent in American history, talking about the unwinding of this massive balance sheet. Where do you, where do you think the risks lie? What are you watching for the red flags that something is going wrong? Yeah. Well, I think you've got to look at long-term rates. Uh, first of all, see what impact this has on long-term rates yeah. uh, and the spread between short-term and long-term rates. Um, and uh, obviously, if long-term rates start to go up very rapidly, uh, you see it in the markets, and that would have an adverse impact on the housing market and, uh, and the economy. Randy, what do you think? And I, I very much agree with, with what Michael had said. This is something we haven't seen before or done before. It's happening not only in the U.S., but it's also going to be happening in other countries, ex with the exception of Japan, probably. Um, uh, probably in our lifetimes, they will still be buying uh, assets who have <laughs> five times GDP. It's going to be very difficult for them to unwind, particularly And Randy's very young, too. <laughs> <laughs> and it's also particularly difficult because they've been buying equities. And uh, people tend to be much more sensitive to equity price movements. Like if you watch uh, the financial press, there's much more focus on how the equity markets are moving than the, the bond markets. Now, the bond markets may be more important, ultimately, for financing of, uh, of, of activity. Uh, but you can just imagine if they pull back and the stock market starts to go down, that's going to be really, uh, uh, really, really tough. The thing that worries me is when people are not worried. And that seems to be the, the time that we're in now. If you look at virtually any measure of expected volatility in the markets, whether it's um, some of those indices that are traded on the, uh, the exchanges here in Chicago, whether they are risk spreads, they're at or near record lows. Now, just look around the world. It's even independent of monetary policy, this has got to be at least average for volatility, average for uncertainty. 
and uh, the markets are perceiving it uh, that everything will go just right, that the unwinding will go just perfectly. And it might, and I think um, you know, our former colleagues at the Fed are trying as much as possible to do that. And I think uh, Janet Yellen and company did a superb job of making sure that the announcement of the underwind of the portfolio did not cause uh, the taper tantrum that, uh, that Charlie had, uh, uh, had referred to and the, the volatility in the, in the markets. Uh, but we don't know. And so, as I said, I think it should be at least average. And that, that's the sort of thing that worries me, that people aren't worried. When people aren't worried, they're not prepared. And then a shock can ramify much more rapidly. Don, what are you watching for in terms of potential red flags that this great experiment is going awry? <laughs> well, I think uh, my colleagues have pointed to the risk, which is that interest, interest rates might go up more rapidly than people anticipated. Inflation might rise more rapidly than people anticipate, given the very low unemployment rate, very tight labor markets, pressure on costs. Central banks would have to tighten more. And I do I agree with Randy that there seems to be a lot of confidence out there that inflation is kind of permanently low. There are these global forces holding it down. It can't possibly come back. Central banks, not this is not only about the US, but everywhere, central banks will be able to hold these low interest rates for quite a long period of time. And the US will go up very gradually to a very low level. And I think what might, and then people are taking risk positions based on that expectation. And it seems to me that the distribution of possible outcomes is very one-sided. So interest rates aren't going to go down. They can only go up gradually or go up more rapidly. So I think the, the risk is that people have underweighted the potential for an adjustment in interest rates and adjustment in inflation. Uh, that may, that's not the central tendency, I would predict. So I think gradual, everything's under control. That's probably what will happen, but there is a risk out there. I think we're not getting sanguine from these guys. That might be a little bit worrisome. <laughs> you <laughs> asked us about the risks. <laughs> yeah. I, wanted to, I guess the question was geared to get a certain answer. Michael, I wanted to come back to something Janet Yellen had said. She said, although we work through financial markets, our goal is to help Main Street, not Wall Street. And yet there are charges that unconventional monetary policy has made the rich richer and the poor poorer. In fact, I put it that way in a piece once. Was I wrong? Well, uh, that's hard to respond to. <laughs> <laughs> I would say. I'm opening myself you put up for criticism. You're in a very difficult position. <laughs> I'm completely wrong. <laughs> but uh, I'd say in part you're wrong and in part you're right. So uh, the unconventional policy did uh, as I mentioned, it lowered long-term rates. Yeah. Uh, it increased uh, equity markets, uh, clearly. And um, I think that helped people who have equities, obviously. And a lot of people in the United States don't, aren't, aren't participating in the stock market. So they didn't benefit uh, from that. On the other hand, uh, what it did is increase the growth rate of the economy short term. And therefore, a lot of people got jobs uh, who wouldn't have otherwise gotten jobs. Or people who were working part-time were able to get full-time jobs. Uh, so they benefited on that side. And of course, it's hard to see. You, know, you, you see the increase in the stock market every day uh, as the ticker tape comes across. But, um, so I think there's some, some people who benefited and some people who were hurt. Now, I shouldn't say hurt by this, but didn't participate in the uh, upswing in equity prices. Do you want to chime in? So I'd say, yes, you're wrong. Uh, <laughs> He's not even trying I, to be political. <laughs> I was more delicate. <laughs> so I think not only think about what Michael said, more people have jobs. People who are unemployed are employed. Yep. Those are not going to be well-off people, right. right? The other thing to say is think about borrowers and lenders. So who benefits from low interest rates? Borrowers. Right. Who has hurt? Lenders. Now, there are lots of lenders that you shouldn't be hurt. It's hard. If you're retired, you're living on fixed income. But I would say, on, if I would guess, on average, borrowers are going to have lower incomes than lenders are going to have. So I think the benefit probably on balance uh, pretty much went to people at the lower end of the income spectrum, people starting out in life who are borrowing to buy a house 
borrowing to buy a car, saving for education. Um, saving for education, maybe not so, because that would be the interest rates that they didn't get. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Randy, what about the cost to savers and the cost to people dependent on pension plan returns? Well, certainly this is one of the things that, uh, that Don referred to. And uh, obviously, it will depend on uh, what your portfolio look like. Roughly a majority of Americans have some direct or indirect exposure to the equity market. And so that's something that uh, will help people. A very large fraction of people have a very significant amount of their um, households, have a significant amount of their wealth in their houses. By buying the, um, the mortgage-backed securities, the agency securities, by keeping the longer rates low, uh, that and by sort of getting the pipes unclogged, and that was very helpful in putting a floor on the housing market. In Japan, they had a shock, and that led housing prices and the price of real estate in Tokyo to go down by 90%. And it has only recently started to come back. So it stayed, you know, astonishing losses of, you know, on in the order of 80 or 90% for more than a decade. And, and so I think that helps, you know, a, a wide variety of, of people. But I, I wanted to pick up one, one of the things that, that Don said. If you drill down into the employment statistics, Obviously, there have been an enormous number of jobs that have been created uh, since the, uh, the recovery has, has begun. You know, on average, 200,000 um, jobs per month uh, you know, since basically 2009, 2010. That's a lot of jobs. And um, most of those, I shouldn't say most of them, but a disproportionate number of those jobs have been at the lower end of the, um, uh, of, of the wage spectrum. And so actually this is one of the issues that, uh, that uh, people have been doing, that the Fed currently at the uh, San Francisco Fed and at the, the, uh, the board have been looking at, well, what does 4.1% em employment mean? Well, there's actually been a bit of a change in the composition, and not just 4.1% unemployment, but also the low uh, wage gains. Well, there's been a change in the composition so that most of the, uh, or I shouldn't, again, I shouldn't say most, but a disproportionate number of the, the jobs that have been created uh, since 2010 have been lower income jobs. So when you're looking at the average wage, which is what is being reported, that is not going to grow as fast when you have more jobs growing at the uh, lower part of the spectrum than the upper part of the spectrum. So to some extent, the, um, uh, the, the low reported wage growth is partially this composition effect that you're growing more at the, uh, at the lower end. So it's going to be, you know, seem like overall we're getting less wage recovery. But um, and second, there's a lot at this uh, at the lower end that, that's been going on. So I think uh, that's often lost in the uh, in the debates. And I think this this composition effect is very important. And then it affects the indicators of what the Fed should be looking at for thinking about inflation and and how the economy is doing. And just one one last thing on that. Um, we, we, uh, we all know that, um, the, and I put in quotation marks, that uh, you know, median household income has been declining and is just in terrible straits. But how many of you know that over the last two years it has gone up extraordinarily rapidly, particularly the last year, the gain was perhaps the largest that we have on record, and now median house, real household income is the highest that it has ever been. No one knows that. I didn't know that. It was reported and then disappeared from the newspapers because that was not part of the narrative. The narrative is that we all know that median household income is in, in terrible straits. We like states. bad news, <laughs> the and, and, press. Um, but it's, it, it's not. That's, that's fascinating. I think I've been told I need to rewrite my piece. Uh, <laughs> so in 2014, the New Yorker wrote this. The Fed, not the Treasury or the White House or Congress, is now the primary economic policymaker in the United States and therefore the world. Everybody is watching. I wanted to actually do a quick question for the audience, a quick show of hands. How many of you worry that the Federal Reserve is too powerful? No one. <laughs> See, there are too many of our friends out there. <laughs> <laughs> Michael's packed the audience. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How many worried that the Fed is not powerful enough? Huh? The same number. See, you do have supporters in this room. It seems like everybody thinks you got it just right. Uh, <laughs> But there has been this giant growth of controversy about the Fed, which was, which was controversial at its birth, a well-known book about its creation called it The Creature from Jekyll Island, um, <laughs> which I guess gives some flavor for it. And it's controversial again today. Don, why do you think that is? I think there was a considerable amount of misunderstanding of what we did in the crisis. Mm -hmm. And the lending that Randy referred to, 
to banks, to non-banks, uh, saving the, in my view, saving the system under Ben's leadership from a much, much worse outcome than would have occurred. So there is a perception, as you mentioned, that somehow we're working for Wall Street and not Main Street. Uh, but in order to, the, the way the Fed helps Main Street is by helping the financial market. So keeping those credit pipes flowing so that people can get loans, people can start businesses, people can grow their businesses. So I think that that was part of it, the sort of misunderstanding of what we did and why we did it. It was a logical extension. Randy mentioned this guy, Badgett, who's the editor of The Economist in the mid-19th century, who said central banks should lend freely at a high interest rate against good collateral, and that's what we did. And he also said to this man and that, so he didn't, he wasn't focused on the banking system. He said the central bank, not the Fed, the Bank of England should lend to everybody who needed it who could bring good collateral to the Bank of England. So I think that's, that was one issue. I think there was also some misunderstanding of what the effects of our unconventional monetary policies would be. So I, I can remember very vividly the 2012 uh, Republican primary in which everybody said the Fed is debasing the currency. And all the Republican candidates agreed on this. Rick Perry threatened Ben Bernanke with physical harm if he came to Texas. <laughs> we know what to do with people like that. Yes. And uh, so the dollar was going to go down, inflation was going to go up. Wrong, wrong, wrong. The dollar is higher, inflation is lower, or certainly no higher than it was. So I think there was misapprehension about what these, because it was unconventional, had been tried before, people were used to looking at the size of central bank's balance sheet and saying there are certain events that flow from that. They don't in circumstances like this. So I, I think that also contributed to the undermining of trust in the, in the, um, in the institution and in a very political political environment. Michael, you wanted to weigh I in. just wanted to add, uh, I agree with everything that Don said. I would take it back uh, before this period. Uh, the Fed was not transparent. <laughs> the Fed was secretive. I joined uh, uh, Fed in 94, in September of 94, and in the spring of 94, for the first time, the Federal Open Market Committee said that they were influencing policy after a meeting or not. They didn't say anything before that. They were, they were completely secretive. And there, of course, you know, there are books written about the secrets of the temple. Right. And people thinking that the Fed is secretive, they're hiding stuff. So the Fed has come a long way since then and is much more transparent today. And something I, I encouraged when I was there, and, and it's, uh, I think, clearly beneficial. But people, there's a lot of misunderstanding about the Fed and a lot of concern that there was something going on behind closed doors that was inappropriate and people were being hurt. I think we're way past that now in terms of, uh, in the terms of transparency, but it's, this is a continuous process that they have to be as open as they possibly can. Randy, even if this is just a perception problem, do you worry that it poses a threat to, this, to the Fed's uh, um, functioning in the future? Yeah, it, it certainly can. Whenever there's misunderstanding, whether it's with any institution, there can be uh, it can be a problem for it. I just want to mention, maybe before 1994, they uh, they had Gene Fama's view, and they weren't inf influencing. Him. <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's where he got his ideas from. <laughs> and then um, uh, on this, I think one of the reasons why um, uh, it, uh, people became concerned the Fed is too powerful is that. Aficionados, and I think there are a lot of those people in the room here, kind of knew the power of central banks. But I don't think your average member of Congress knew how powerful the central bank could be or what powers were given to the central bank. I mean, in the, the last few months that I was there, at the end of, 2009, uh, end of 2008, beginning of 2009, our balance sheet went from 800, 000, uh, 800 billion to 2.4 trillion. We tripled. There was no, there was no congressional vote on this. There was no, you know, active, active Congress, you know, executive order. We just did it, and that's precisely why the central bank was created. The first line of the 
uh, the, uh, uh, the, the Federal Reserve Charter is to provide a more elastic currency because in the panic of 1907, there was no central bank. The system collapsed because there was no liquidity that was being provided. It was very sharp as they wanted someone to have that, that power. Then we exercised that power. It's like, oh my goodness, we never knew anybody you know, that you, we had given you that power. Well, where'd this come from? Well, it actually came from Congress. Uh, and this is what you, t you wanted us to do. Oh, well, we're not so sure about this. And, and I think that was a very big, it was, in some sense, it was a, a teaching moment, as, uh, to use someone else's phrase, for the, uh, for the broad public to see how powerful central, banks, uh, powerful central banks can be. And then going forward, you want to make sure that you have transparency, exactly as Michael had said, because there's a lot of misunderstanding. The less information you have, the easier it is to build conspiracy theories, the easier it is to, to make things up, because you're not are responding to them. You're sort of this magisterial um, uh, organization, people who are sort of like above it all. We don't have to respond to those things. It's extraordinarily important to, to respond to them. It's extraordinarily important to explain what you're doing and why you're doing it. Um, because then you can have a real debate of whether the Fed should have certain powers or not. And interestingly, the Fed, both before the crisis as well as after the crisis, is actually one of the most constrained central banks in the world. So the extraordinary powers that we're using to do the unconventional monetary policy, that would be something that the ECB could do without, without anything extraordinary, it could just normal votes, to do all the things that, uh, that, we, uh, that we did, which had to use those extraordinary powers. So, and then following the, um, uh, uh, the, uh, the crisis and part of the Dodd-Frank reforms, some of the powers to be able to do that lending have been taken away from the Fed. And, uh, and that could be problematic in a crisis. I think. The Fed has now, with these experiences, knows how to set up broad-based programs. What um, the power that was taken away from them was to do lending to individual institutions, which was very clear and very specific in the, um, the amendments to the Federal Reserve Act in the late 1930s to give Fed, the Fed more, more power. That's been taken away. Fortunately, I think uh, the, the power that is there to do these broad-based programs, since we now have had experience doing them, we can, the Fed could probably raise them up fairly quickly. I mean, we were doing them from, from scratch. Uh, and I would love to take credit for the, uh, for the functioning of those programs, but it's really the staff at the Federal Reserve Board who, you know, we would vote, yes, do this, and then we'd say, and make sure it works. Uh, and they did make sure they worked, which was uh, extraordinarily important. That's a nice order to be able to give. I think another aspect, if I could, Bethany, of this transparency is explaining it and explaining it to ordinary folks. So I think the Fed too often uses its transparency in kind of an echo chamber that encompasses the financial markets, the business community, the academic community, talks to the Wall Street Journal and uh, the Financial Times and CNBC and all that, and doesn't reach out beyond that very limited group to ordinary citizens and try to explain things. So I thought a key moment which I'm sorry wasn't repeated more often, was Ben Bernanke going on 60 Minutes. Yep. So there he was reaching out much further, trying to explain what we did and why we did it. And my hope is uh, that Jay Powell, not being a PhD economist and being a more plain spoken person, as you saw in his confirmation hearings, will be able to pick this up and do a bit more of this reaching out beyond the usual Fed group of uh, who it talks to. Do you expect more transparency from Powell going forward? Do I? Mm -hmm. Yes, I do. Uh, I agree with uh, Don's assessment of Jay Powell. I think, uh, I, I don't know him exceptionally well, but I have seen him on a number of occasions <coughs> and he handles himself very well. Um, I mean, we'll have some, you will have some real challenges here coming in to this job because he's not a PhD economist. And uh, he also has, uh, well, this problem that we've talked about before of unwinding the balance sheet and raising rates at the same time. And there are a lot of vacancies on the Federal Reserve Board, plus the head of the New York Fed is stepping down as well. So you'll have a completely new Federal Reserve uh, leadership group uh, going forward. And he's going to have to you know, work to form a consensus among this group, which I think he uh, definitely can do. I was just going to add one thing about yep. the transparency point. Yep. I'll put in a plug for the regional system that the Federal Reserve has, because the Fed has 12 regional reserve banks, <coughs> as we all know. And one of the advantages of, uh, in um, communicating 
is that the reserve banks do indeed deal with a wide range of people, not just bankers and not just business people, but community people, agri people, farmers, uh, unions, and so forth. So they have the opportunity to really help improve the transparency of the Federal Reserve. Randy, what do you think about the challenges that are facing Powell as he takes over? Uh, so I, I think uh, Michael articulated them, uh, them well. And, um, and I was really glad that uh, Don also talked about this, because this, cause most people are saying it's a negative that he doesn't have a PhD. And actually, I was once on uh, one program, uh, and, uh, and so they asked about, well, you know, shouldn't, uh, this is before Powell was chosen, shouldn't the, uh, the, the, the uh, head of the Fed have a PhD? And, and I, I, I made the qualifications and well, you know, since I'm a PhD and an academic, I always lean towards that, but I don't think so. And then actually it was Richard Quest on, on uh, CNN he said, well, Professor Krosner, we really like your thoughts on that. And he kept talking to me, Professor Krosner, after that, after that, he just didn't let up on it. And I was, and I was saying that it's not, you know, it's not necessary. Uh, I mean, I think it can be helpful and you know, there are some challenges in that, but you speak about things in a different way. And I think, um, and you could see that in his hearing. So there was a little bit less precision than, you know, from an academic point of view than Janet Yellen or Ben Bernanke. But he conveyed the ideas to a broader audience in a way that was quite effective. And so a PhD would have been concerned about making sure that everything is technically correct. Because if you, make, you, know, if you violate that, you've kind of violated the covenant. But what he's doing is he's, saying, he's thinking about, well, how do I convey the substance of of this economic issue to the broad audience. And, and I think that's something that's going to be very, very helpful. But making sure that he gets that balance right, that you know, the, the traditional constituency of, sort of the more academic types will say, well, you know, he's speaking very loosely. I don't think he will. I think, uh, but I think getting that, that right and honing that kind of, um, uh, that will be important. And then also the, uh, the balance sheet, I think, is going to be one of the, uh, the big challenges, making sure that that unwind can go smoothly because you know, if the ECB starts on this and the Bank of England starts on this, there could be some glitches along the way. You know, the Fed has said that's going on in the background. That's going to be as exciting as watching paint dry. Uh, and so far, they've succeeded in that. Let's all but, hope they're right. <laughs> you know, sometimes if someone drops a match onto paint, it'll catch on fire. Yeah. And uh, so you have to be a little worried about that. And, and so I think that's going to be more of a challenge than people think, because I think the Fed has been able to convince people, oh, that's just going to go on in the background. But if there are one of the challenges that, uh, that Don or, or Michael mentioned, they may have to adjust that, and then it's not just something that's going on in the background. When we were on our call, one of you mentioned a phrase which I loved and I hadn't heard before, and it's lean versus clean. Mm -hmm. And so who would like to explain that? And if you expect to see Powell perhaps take a different stance than Fed chairmen in the past have on this issue of lean versus clean. Don, do you want to weigh in? So I think I was the one that used that yeah. phrase. So this is the relationship of monetary policy and financial stability. And one of the challenges, as Michael pointed out, is that, and Randy, that with very low interest rates, people are taking higher, perhaps higher risk positions, putting financial stability at risk. Ideally, you'd want to treat that with regulatory supervisory policy, prudential policy, and not have to raise interest rates because you're worried about risk taking in the economy if by raising interest rates you keep more people unemployed and inflation below your 2% target. A, a central bank that practiced leaning might do that, might actually raise interest rates a little bit because they were worried about the risk profile being developed out there, thereby taking longer to hit their employment and inflation targets. Clean was a reference to the way, say, Alan Greenspan or Ben Bernanke or Janet Yellen thought about it was monetary policy is the last line of defense against these stability things that if something, we sh the first line of defense is prudential policy. If something bad happens, we should be able to clean it up with easier monetary policy. Now, I think the problem with making that argument today is it didn't work in 2008, 2009. So I think you need to really strengthen the prudential supervision beforehand so that you don't get in a situation where monetary, but lean versus clean had to do with what to, what to use, mon whether monetary policy should be tilted in one direction or another for financial stability. 
So I've learned a great deal, um, including my mistakes in my previous pieces of work. <laughs> <laughs> and this idea that household income is now at an all-time high, which I think is counterintuitive and really important. And I wanted to turn it over to the audience for questions. Great. Thanks so much, Bethany. Now we'd like to go out to you. If you could please raise your arms, wait for the mic, and make sure your question's a question. Um, we'll start off here, please, in the front row. Terry Diamond. Right here, please, in the front row. This may be somewhat related to the lean versus clean, but I always thought that in the past, the Fed's job was to take the punch bowl away when the party was getting out of hand. Then it seemed that the philosophy was we can't tell when there's a bubble, and therefore our job is to help make a transition after it's come down. So whereas on the one hand, I understand how difficult it is to actually see the bubble, on the other hand, that may have created a put that led to moral hazard. So I'm wondering, number one, since Charlie is over here, what your observations are of where the Fed is on that spectrum now and what your thoughts are about those two things. So I think when, um, I guess, Mc, uh, McChesney Martin, right, used the mm -hmm. take away the punch bowl yep. while the party was getting going, my impression is he was talking about the economy, not necessarily about financial markets. And so we have a situation, we've had a situation over the last six, seven, eight, nine years of a weak economy um, and inflation coming in below the Fed's 2% target. So I think the, from the Fed's perspective, the punch bowls just got spiked within the last year or two when unemployment rates came down quite considerably. And you'll notice that it is raising interest rates gradually to try and engineer a soft landing both for employment and for inflation at its 2% target. So I think uh, uh, the Fed thinks it's taking away the punch bowl or at least taking some of the spike out of the punch bowl if that's possible um, for the economy right now. The doing it for the financial markets when the economy, if you think the financial markets are over exuberant, when the economy isn't, then you're looking at a trade-off. So if you want to lean on the financial markets, take care of that risk by raising interest rates, then you're perhaps going to fall short on the macroeconomic the employment. And, and remember, the Congress said to the Federal Reserve, your goals are maximum employment, stable prices, to the FOMC. So I think it's, it's hard to use in my view, monetary policy to fight these financial stability issues unless you run through everything else in terms, in terms of your predict. You really think there's a risk to future income, future stability, and, you, and you've tried everything else. You've tried the bank supervision. You've tried uh, open mouth policy, et cetera, and that's not working. Then you may have to use monetary policy. A worry I have in the United States is that we don't have very many of these prudential tools, or we don't have tools that are capable of being used, particularly in the housing market and real estate market. So unlike almost every other country where there's an authority that can set loan-to-value ratios, loan-to-income ratios, things like that, we don't have that here. Most crises start in the real estate market. We're not we've kind of deprived ourselves of having the tools to fight a real estate problem without tanking the whole economy. So I, I worry that we don't have as many tools to, on the prudential side as we should, and monetary policy may get pushed into that, pushed into the lean side earlier than it should. But I think, by and large, you need to differentiate the asset markets from the economy. Thanks. We just have a few minutes left. So, Randy, I want to give you a quick question from the audience. It's the most popular one tonight. Who performed better in the financial crisis, the Fed or the ECB? Oh. <laughs> wow, you're making me uh, choose. Uh... In one minute or less, please. Okay. <laughs> well, let me just say one thing about lean versus clean. So I'm fairly lean, and so that suggests that I'm dirty. Uh, you know, lean versus clean, uh, I'm not dirty. <laughs> so, uh, um, well, boy, that went over really well. <laughs> You're on a roll. Oh, yeah. Now let's, let's make enemies of the Fed and the uh, ECB. Yes. <laughs> Professor, as he, uh, as he said. Um, so I think, I think that the ECB has a much more difficult task, because in buying assets, we could focus on 
assets that were either U.S. Treasury securities or securities that effectively had a, a federal government backstop these Treasury securities and then Freddie and Fannie after they were in the conservatorship. The ECB is trying to buy assets from all the different states. So it would be just like if uh, uh, Ben Bernanke and, uh, and Janet Yellen uh, and then Jay Powell, go, well, they've stopped buying the assets, had to choose, well, do we buy Illinois bonds or do we buy New Jersey bonds or do we buy California bonds? And you can imagine the, you know, the, the, the political turmoil that would be associated with, with that and all the lobbying that would go on. So I think they were uh, a bit slower to respond and had more difficulties kind of using some of the same tools that we had, but it's, they're in a very different situation than we are in the US. And so that's why I would be, I'd be loath to say that they didn't perform as well. I think given the constraints, they probably performed as well, but I think the constraints were much greater. You'll be welcome back in Brussels, so. Um, <laughs> Michael, given your wealth of experience and we're here celebrating your service and a, a big birthday, maybe you'll be a bit forward looking for us and give us your comments on unregulated cryptocurrency or Bitcoin, in or out, what do you think? <laughs> And you have a PhD in economics, right? Yeah, I have, I do. Uh, <laughs> I am very concerned about uh, the whole cryptocurrency uh, uh, development and uh, Bitcoin and so forth. When you know, people claim, the proponents of Bitcoin claim it's going to be a store, it's going to be a currency and therefore a store of value, and the price goes down 40% in uh, you know, a couple of weeks, uh, that to me, just uh, means that it, it just, I just don't see how it's going to ever be a true store of value. Um, I think there are a lot of people speculating in Bitcoin now and, uh, and other cryptocurrencies too. And I think a lot of people are going to get hurt. Uh, now, I, do I think it's going to cause a financial crisis? No, I really don't because that's not really working through the banking system or our financial institutions in any way. It's individuals will get hurt with the fluctuations in these uh, currencies. Uh, but uh, I don't think it's, uh, it's something that's going to systemic and cause a financial crisis. Don, you look like you're ready to say something. Uh, I agree with Michael. OK. <laughs> Randy, any different opinion there? No? OK, great. Well, ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately, that's all we have time for tonight. But please, can you join me in thanking Randy, Michael, Don, and Bethany for their comments tonight. Thanks, Randy. And thank you. Hopefully see you online tomorrow for Japan. Good evening. We're adjourned.